All right. Welcome to the Humane Hoax Online Conference. I am so honored to introduce our first speaker for the day. Today, we have Renee King Sonnen joining us. She is the founder and executive director of Rowdy Girl Sanctuary. That is a sanctuary that transformed from a Texas cattle ranch to a sanctuary, it was the first documented beef ranch conversion to a 100% vegan sanctuary in history. Rowdy Girl Sanctuary is changing the world for farmed animals with programs like the Rancher Advocacy Program, an educational program that inspires ranchers to consider alternatives to animal farming. She's been the subject of a documentary that's out now called Rowdy Girl. And Renee was recently on my podcast, the Hope for the Animals podcast, and she talked about when she was transitioning her ranch, how she thought about trying to do it humanely right to 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 try to do it humanely and i thought wow what an interesting angle that we hardly ever hear from we hardly ever hear that side of it right from a farmer who wants to try to do it better that what is their experience so now we get to hear firsthand that side of the humane hoax thank you so much for joining us renee king sonnen thank you thank you hope and it's such an honor to be here at the Humane Hoax uh, Conference with all of you. Um, yes, I am from uh, the big state of Texas. I always uh, joke around and say, you know, Texas thinks it's its own country. Uh, you know, we uh, we try to we try to you know the country the the tech the state itself really tries to have a bigger than life uh, presence, especially when it comes to cattle ranchers. You know, my story started uh, way back you know, years and years and years ago, uh, you know, on a Texas cattle ranch, whenever I married my husband, Tommy, for the second time. And when I married Tommy, I moved to the ranch and had no idea that I was going to, you know, start seeing the animals and experiencing the lives of these animals as as sentient and like my own cats and dogs. You know, one of the pivotal moments for me in realizing all of this as a cattle rancher's wife was, was when I moved to the ranch, you know, I, 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 it's like I got thrown into the center of what it really is like to be a cattle rancher. Uh, because from the outside looking in, all those cows look pastoral. They look like they're living the good life. You know, if you just pass by them on a country rural road, you see them grazing, you see them with their babies and you think, oh, isn't that beautiful? What you don't see is the humane washing that goes on behind the scenes of all of those animals that end up in cell barns, feedlots, and in slaughterhouses. I began to witness firsthand um, another pivotal moment with Rowdy Girl. And I began to witness firsthand how my relationship with Rowdy Girl was becoming just like my relationship with my cats and dogs. And so when I when I started falling in love with Rowdy Girl, I was met with so much resistance because I had to, it was like I was being forced uh, to have a certain kind of relationship with her. Uh, even though I was bottle feeding her, I was taking care of her. At the same time, I was being forced to realize that one day, you know, she was going to be leaving and going, you know, to auction. And I, and I just couldn't stomach it. And so as I began to feed Rowdy Girl, I began to see all of the other uh, animals in the, in the pastures, and they began to speak to my soul. They didn't speak out loud, but they began to speak to my conscience. Um, and it wasn't too long after that that I began to name them all. And, you know, if you, if you don't know the story of Rowdy Girl, I recommend that you go to our website and just look at all the media stories that is out there because our story's been 
told around the world and in multiple languages and it's been on CBS Evening News and other outlets and, and you know including like uh, Hope was saying the uh, the humane um, her 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 podcast but learn the whole story because I'm going to skip forward in this story to the day I realized that I could no longer no longer do uh you know the wrong thing you know I I was I tried so hard to do the wrong thing the right way and as I was transitioning and I and you know I didn't know I was transitioning I'm not one of those vegans that said oh I think I'm going to transition and go vegan if you're a cattle rancher you know you don't you don't transition to go vegan if you're if you know it's not typical it's not even in your your realm of reference to transition to go vegan because your belief system is that you use the animals uh, and commodify them because you're providing food for the country right and so when i began to change i began to want to do things more humanely and it was very interesting um i began to watch videos because I wanted to see what was happening to the calves we were sending to the cell barn. And every every video I watched was not particularly humane, but I was trying to find one. I was trying to find the humane way to do the right thing uh, or the wrong thing. Uh, you know, and my husband kept telling me, Renee, quit watching all those videos. It's just Peter propaganda. And I mean, he told me that a thousand times that I was just, you know, falling in the footsteps of Peter propaganda. I'll never forget that because I didn't even really understand Peter or anything about animal rights or nothing until I started looking into Peter propaganda. And here I am, a cattle rancher's wife, trying to figure out how to buy my eggs humanely, buy my milk humanely, buy our meat humanely. And because I couldn't stand the idea of what was going on in them factory farms. And, um, you know, and as I began to do my research, we began to get humane. We, we started getting our milk from a local dairy. So the local dairy would bring us big old case of fresh milk straight from, you know, the, the farmer just up the road. And on top of the, on top of the milk jugs, was the name of the cow that the milk came from. You know, Della, Susie, you know, Moxie, Myrtle, whatever, you know, the name of the, the cows. And I felt so comfortable, you know, and justified knowing that when I poured that milk and drank it, I was drinking from a cow that was humanely treated wrong. As I began to do my research about where those cows came from and what happened to their babies, I was just gutted. Uh, their babies were taken away from them. Uh, they were they were thrown in fields, you know, and left to die. Uh, they were they were killed uh, within minutes or a day or two of their birth. Or the or the or the females were put in the same, you know, situation as their mama to become a breeder stock to have more babies and to make milk. So, you know, I began to see that there was something really wrong with what we were doing. And it was that type of motivation for me as a cattle rancher that began to see that there was something innately wrong. It felt evil. And yet we were conditioned to not only see it as righteous, but to believe with all of our hearts and souls that it was us. We were the ones feeding the world and we were justified through religion, through education, through government, you know, through all of it, through the media. We were justified. We were held up. We were propped up to uh, to feed these animals So and to, and to sell them as, uh, as profit. So when I began to have my awakening, uh, I didn't know that on October 31st, 2014, I was going to go vegan. 
I happened to go vegan on Halloween. It wasn't planned. Never. Uh, it's just that all of my research led up to a moment in time when I saw the Melanie Joy dissertation on carnism. And if you haven't seen Dr. Melanie Joy's dissertation, you know, and I just love her. We have become really good friends. I, I, I've, I've, I had the privilege and the honor of spending a whole week with her uh, in San Juan, Puerto Rico recently. And it was the most amazing time to sit and listen and learn from, you know, an expert like her, because it was her little documentary that spoke to my heart the day I went vegan. There's a whole family eating beef stew. Everybody's enjoying beef stew. And somebody at the table says, well, can you tell me what the recipe is? This is so good. And the lady of the house says, oh, I'm so glad you asked. You start off with a pound of very young golden retriever. So take a moment and take that in. I, I could have been at that moment, all the Peter propaganda, I, all the videos, all the stuff for years and years and years. It took years for me to go vegan. I didn't know I was going vegan, but it took years and years and years for me to get to this point on October 31st to where I was just like blown away with the fact that I could be eating a chopped up dead baby golden retriever and I wouldn't even know it. Because you don't know what's in that bowl. When you're eating beef stew, you don't know what that body flesh that's chopped up in little pieces really is. You're just buying a package of chopped up body parts and making stew out of it. And at that moment, that penetrated. It got in here and I was like, oh, I was jolted. I was jolted like I had never been before. And my husband said, Renee, Renee, come on, get ready. We got to go to my mom's. You know, where there was a big, uh, a big little, a big little uh, event that happened every Halloween. It was a block party for all the kids and their costumes and all the in-laws and the outlaws and the family all got together to watch the kids parade down the block with all their costumes on. And we all sat out in the yard, you know, having our iced tea and, you know, having dinner and all that stuff. So anyway, we go to my mother-in-law's house. Her name was Effie, God rest her soul. And we walk in the door with all the kids playing and my mother-in-law brings out a pot of beef stew. Hey, the universe could not have timed this any better. I is like my ears started ringing. I started seeing double and I just knew I couldn't eat it. And I'd always eaten it before. And my mother-in-law brought it out, you know, so proud and you could smell it all in the house. And she was like fixing to ladle me out a big old bowl, you know, and I was like, oh, no, I, I can't eat that. And everybody's there in the house. They're all talking. They're all playing. Everybody's doing all that. And then I said, she said, well, why not, Renee? I said, because it's got floating dead, hack, hacked up animal bodies in it, and I can't eat it. Oh, my God. You would have thought I had, you know, kicked my mother in the face with my heel, my mother-in-law. And she said, well, Renee, what did you say? And I repeated myself because it's got floating dead hacked up animal bodies in it. And everybody in the house got quiet. They looked at me and they were just like, their mouth was open like, oh, like, like that, you know? And she said, well, Renee, you can pick it out. And I said, nope, there ain't no more picking it out. And at that moment, y'all, that was the moment I knew that there was no right way that I could eat beef stew it, it, it or anything remotely resembling an animal. Uh, I immediately became my husband's worst nightmare and his greatest vision for the future because I went into animal activist mode and I didn't even know I had it in me. I had no idea there was an animal activist inside of me waiting to be born. Uh, and at that moment on Halloween 2014, she came, she came out of the closet. 
And I began to uh, do any and everything I could to be a voice for these cows. Uh, I end up I ended up rescuing the whole herd from my husband, and I bought them all from him, and started the first ever documented beef cattle ranch, you know, vegan conversion in the world that I know of. I mean, I mean, there's a lot that's happened since. There's been cattle ranchers. I mean, I know Howard Lyman transitioned before us, but he didn't transition his cattle operation into a vegan farm. He, in fact, was one of my greatest, greatest mentors early on. And, you know, one of the main struggles that we had transitioning our cattle ranch, you know, Tommy didn't go vegan right away. My husband went vegan, though, to his credit. I went vegan in October, and in, on May 2nd, 2015, he flipped the switch and went vegan. So he wouldn't, he didn't, he didn't wait too long. And from October to May, I was, I was relentless. I would not let Tommy eat any animal products in the house because y'all, I, all I saw was death and suffering. I could not stand it. I realized that we could not, neither could he. I mean, I don't, I don't recommend that everybody do it the way I did it. I don't know if, if that's the right way or not. I just know that I personally could not stand the idea of animal products being in my home. Uh, still, I won't allow it. I do not allow animal products in our home. I do not allow animal products at the sanctuary. And you can get fired down there, man. You bring, you, you know, understandably, if it's not on purpose and, you know, it's somebody that, you know, it's a, it's a mistake. But we don't do that. And so it, in our home, Tommy was really mad at me because I wouldn't let him eat his meat and his cheese and his eggs and his milk. I kept, you know, I'd throw it out and I'd say, no, we're not eating that here. And he would say, well, I live here too. And I was like, well, you may live here, but if you want to eat here, you're going to eat vegan. If you want to eat that stuff out there, that's on you. But you're going to eat in this house, you're going to eat vegan because my soul cannot endure the suffering that I know those animals went through. Now, why didn't I feel that suffering and that pain before? Why didn't I recognize that animals suffered and died horrifically for me to eat? Conditioning, programming, indoctrination, education, we are force-fed violence, and it's normalized. Force-fed violence. There is no right way to consume, eat, breed, commodify violence. You can't do it. And before my husband went vegan, there was a, a film crew that came out. They wanted to tell our story, you know, we had not all the way funded yet. I was raising the money to buy my husband's cows. Tommy had gotten into a place where he was beginning to feel, you know, good about it. He, he saw that I was actually raising the money. He couldn't believe it, but I was raising the money. And you'll have to go back and listen to that story if you haven't heard it. It's, it's quite colorful. Uh, I don't have time here to tell all of it. But when Tommy realized I was actually going to do it, he started kind of relaxing and, and, and getting into to the rhythm of it. And he was like, wow, he never wanted to hurt the animals. He was like most traditional cattle ranchers. They're not cattle ranching because they want to hurt animals. They're cattle ranching because it's their way of life. It's their culture. It's their tradition. Their grandpa did it. Their great grandpa, their great, great grandpa. It's, you know, it's, it's heritage. And that's what Tommy was doing. He didn't realize he was doing the wrong thing until I forced him to see it. And, you know, when he began to see it between that time period, that film crew was coming in and they wanted to film us. Now, they weren't vegan. They were purportedly vegetarian. And they were all like, in fact, I signed a five-year NDA, you know, I'm out of it now. I'm outside of, I could tell you the names of these companies, but I'm not, 
not here. If y'all want to reach out to me individually, I'll share the story. But suffice it to say that two big companies were behind it. And they had all told the film producer, if if we cooperate, that we they were going to like give us all kind of money to just make our farm, you know, sparkle, come to life, new bars, new roads, new fences, you name it. It was, it was like carte blanche. They came out and did a beautiful video of the red trailer. You know, you can go on my YouTube and you can see the red trailer song. And they filmed all this footage and they were making us all these promises. And then on May 2nd, 2015, we funded. I raised the money. I bought my husband's cows. And it was crickets. I heard nothing else from these people. And I was so heartbroken. I was like, what happened? You know, we were brand new vegan, or I was. Uh, and Tommy went vegan on May 2nd, 2015, the day we actually funded. Tommy turned the corner. And I kept calling and calling and calling. And finally, I got a hold of her. And she said, well, Renee, I just have to tell you the reason why is because we chose another farm that decided to go humane. We were hoping and still hoping if if you and your husband want to transition your farm to a humane meat farm, then we will still do the documentary. I was like, what? I couldn't even believe it. We were being set up by this film company. They were hoping that I wouldn't fund. They were hoping, my because my husband wasn't vegan yet, they could convince my husband with money, with prestige, with all the stuff, the bells and whistles, you know, to become a humane meat farmer. My husband was so mad. He, he was just, just turning vegan. He said, you tell them people to get, you know what? And... I have never seen the kind of anger and violence and hurt all at once inside of me when I realized that we were set up. Um, you know, these humane meat farms, quote unquote, are big business. And if they could have owned our story, imagine, imagine what kind of story would be out there right now. You know, and I just want to take a minute on that note. I want to take a minute to read a story to you. Once upon a time, there was a small family farm nestled in the heart of the countryside. The farm had been passed down through generations, and the family took great pride in their work, raising cattle and tending to the land. However, as time passed, the youngest member of the family, a compassionate and curious teenager, began to question the practices of the farm. She couldn't shake the feeling of unease every time she witnessed the separation of mother cows from their calves or the solemn journey of animals to the slaughterhouse. Driven by a deep sense of empathy and a desire for change, the teenager embarked on a journey of exploration and discovery. She immersed herself in books, documentaries, and conversations with activists, learning about the realities of animal agriculture and the profound impact it had, it had on both animals and the planet. As her understanding grew, so did her conviction to make a difference. With courage and determination, she approached her family with a radical proposal to transition the farm from raising cattle for meat to cultivating plant-based crops. At first, her suggestion was met with skepticism and resistance. The family had relied on cattle ranching for their livelihood for generations, and the idea of abandoning tradition was daunting. But the teenager persisted, sharing her vision of a farm rooted in compassion and sustainability. She introduced her family to the concept of veganic farming a method of agriculture that eschews the use of animal products and emphasizes soil health and biodiversity. Slowly but surely, her family began to see the merit in her proposal. They recognized the ethical imperative to treat animals with kindness and respect 
and the environment, environmental necessity of transitioning to a plant-based diet. With renewed purpose and passion, the family embarked on a new chapter in their farming journey. They transformed their fields into thriving gardens, growing a diverse array of fruits, vegetables, and grains without the need for animal inputs. Word of their innovative approach spread far and wide, inspiring other farmers to reconsider their practices and consumers to make more conscious food choices. The farm became a beacon of hope and possibility, demonstrating that there is indeed a better way to steward the land and nourish our bodies without causing harm to animals. And so the teenager's bold vision an unwavering commitment to compassion not only transformed her family's farm, but also sparked a ripple effect of positive change that reverberated throughout the community and beyond. Imagine, imagine that happening. It's got to happen. This is what has got to happen in our world if we are going to transition the consciousness of farmers. Because y'all, you know, we just got to be real clear. There's, there's still over 90 billion animals being slaughtered around the world right now. You know, when you look at it from the, from the top looking down, there ain't, it ain't, it ain't getting smaller. You know, animal ag is huge. And we have a government that does not give small farmers like the one I just talked about in that little story a chance. They don't give those farmers an option to transition their farms from animal ag into a plant-based farm or a veganic farm. There's no incentives. All the incentives are given to bid the big guys. Or there are, the incentives are given to farmers, uh, you know, like us, if we lose our animals, you know, to floods or fires. They, you know, they just give you a bunch more animals and let you start all over again. But they don't say, hey, since you're in a environmental area that's prone to, you know, climate change, why don't we try something new? This is what's got to happen. This is what's got to happen if we are gonna truly transition our planet. I'm on the board of directors of Agriculture Fairness Alliance. It's a 501c4 vegan back lobbying group. And that is what our mission is. But y'all, it changes hard. Our government is full of tradition, culture, heritage that's steeped in animal agriculture for generations. The lobbyists in our government, the staffers, they're all part of the big act. So vegans out there, if you're looking for something to do to really make a difference, get involved, you know, go to your local governments and become a a staffer, become a vegan lobbyist, do whatever you got to to get in the doors to make change because it ain't it ain't happening fast enough for us. You know, no matter how much food is being, you know, created, no matter how much vegan food, vegan change, animal ag is bigger. And we've got to become more organized and get bigger. So I hope my my presentation to all of you about the fact that there is no right way to do the wrong thing made impact. I hope you out there will consider sharing the story, going on our website, sharing the story, you know, because it's stories that change people. It's stories like the one I just read. It's stories like, you know, like Tommy and I, you know, uh, transitioning from Texas cattle ranchers to a vegan farm. It's stories you know, like that, that get attention and make people question. So I really, really appreciate everything. I, I know that, I know that change can happen. I know that it will happen, but it's going to happen when folks like us on this panel and those listening become bold and brave enough to get out front and tell the world that you live in that there is no right way to kill and eat an animal. Thank you so much. I, uh, I really appreciate it, Hope.
Oh, thank you, Renee. That was fantastic. It's it's really such a powerful uh, per, uh, um, perspective that you have uh, coming from that industry. Uh, it's really, really amazing. Um, so the chat is now enabled. We had a little trouble with it, but now we are chatting away. So that's good. Uh, and we do have questions. So we're going to go into our Q&A period for just a short time here. If you need to take a break, now's a good time. Um, and we have people from all over the world. We have someone from South Africa. We have Canada. I saw someone from Belgium. So just amazing that you're all here. Thank you so, so much. So uh, Renee, I'll, I'll start with this question for you. Someone asked, Christine asked, how has your family reacted since the transition? And how's the farming community around you reacted? Well, the transition, good question. The transition happened, you know, in 2014, early 2015. So our family, my family has been good. I mean, there's really been no issues. My mother in the beginning, you know, was mortified, you know, telling me I was going against my husband and how dare I, you know, do that to my husband and, you know, but she sees now and, and she's on board now, even though she's not vegan, she's very proud of me, quote unquote. Um, my Now, my husband's family is a little different, you know, um, though they do come around, they bring their kids to to see the animals, to come out and visit. It's, it's, it's not often. And there's tension, you know, because some of my husband's family has cattle ranches still. And so it, it's tense. And, uh, you know, it, and, and, and some of the family members that have cattle rancher ranches were once very, very close to my husband. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's tense. Yeah. Well, and but the ranching community around you, if it's interesting because in your in your film in Rowdy Girl, the documentary that was just made and just came out recently, uh, you kind of we we see some of that. We see some of the surrounding uh, ranchers and how they're actually utilizing and how and bringing uh, someone brought a calf to you that needed a home. So yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, that's uh he's still a friend of ours. In fact, his his name is Sonny. And him and his partner both donate to Rowdy Girl. You know, we have cattle ranchers that donate to us on a regular wow. basis. That's amazing. <laughs> it is. It really, really is. Yeah. Because one of the things that we do as former cattle ranchers is we invite the other cattle ranchers. To, we, we, we're we not like antagonistic. We don't tell them you need to go vegan. We don't tell them you need to end your, you know, end and stop doing what you're doing. We live by example around them because the worst thing you can do as a former cattle rancher to cattle ranchers is, is, is do that. You will, you will alienate them like that and you will never get an opportunity to mm. change. You've got to be able to meet people where they are in this respect and and have and have good, bold conversations with them, just like I did with Sonny in that documentary. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I, yeah, I've had and I've had conversations just like that with other cattle ranchers all around us. You mm -hmm. know, they supply us hay. You know, we have to buy our hay from cattle ranchers. You know, you can't buy hay from vegans. Right. <laughs> I yeah. mean. You know, whenever we whenever we got flooded those three times and had to move uh, all our animals, it was it was it was not vegans coming in to help us for the most part. It was cowboys on horses. Wow, wow, you see? yeah. So you know they they were able to get in when nobody else could on those horses. So even though I don't condone riding horses, I ain't gonna tell that cowboy out there uh, you can't help me because you're riding a horse. So I'm gonna let all my animals drown. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it, you have such an amazing position and um, and and kind of a, a really privileged position to be able to relate 
to them and in a loving way, show them a different way. Uh, it's really, really amazing. So you, you kind of touched on it, I think a bit, but I, I did want to just pull on that when you were transitioning, you were, were considering slaughtering your own animals. You, you were like, well, okay, we've got to do this right. We've got to do it humanely. So let's do it ourselves. And, but then you're confronted with the reality of what this is all about that, oh, we're not just sending them off to some slaughterhouse, then we're having to actually do the killing. Can you talk about that? Sure. I was going to talk about it uh, in my talk and I totally forgot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there was a moment when I was trying to push my husband um, away from what we were doing. And I, cause I didn't, I didn't like sending our animals to the cell barn. I didn't like the fact that we would send them to the cell barn, but yet we would go buy meat from the store and, and not only buy meat, but we would buy the expensive grass fed, you know, top of the grade, you know, like they, like they do in Whole Foods where they, they grade everything, you know, most humane and you pay more for it. Uh, all bull crap. And anyway, it was during that time that I told my husband, look, if we're going to be in this business, why don't we kill our own animals? How come we're sending our animals to a cell barn buying this expensive meat when we have all this? We know where this meat comes from. And he said, Renee, I can't do that. I can't eat my own animals. I said, well, that's just messed up, you know. And so I embarked on a journey to, to make him. I forced him to choose which one are we going to send to the local butcher and slaughter and we're going to divide it up amongst the community and give them an opportunity to buy their meat right from us. And, um, you know, we never did it. Uh, it was it was from that moment on that we transitioned uh, and I went vegan. But it took steps like that for me realizing that there that I couldn't do it. He couldn't do it ourselves. I mean, we could send them off to have it done. We could, we could close the door on that, and you know, without having to to see it ourselves. But even my husband would say, when he would take them calves to the cell barn, he hated doing it because those calves lived six months or so on our land with their mamas. And then when he would take them to the cell barn, they'd get branded, they'd get tagged, they'd get prodded, and they were looking at my husband like with eyes of betrayal, with tears in their eyes. And he was the last one they saw when he turned their back on them. You know, I still tear up when I think about all those animals that I was uh, responsible for. I still, I, and that's why I'm so convicted to the day I die to do whatever I can to stay out front. You can't, I can't be back in the bushes I can't be off in the middle. You know, I got to stay out front no matter what. And sometimes being on front lines, I'm telling you what, you can get hated on pretty fierce. You know, I've certainly had my share, but it doesn't matter to me. You know, the animals uh, suffering, all the things I did as a former cattle rancher to contribute to all that, I will spend my lifetime making recompense. Well, you are, you're doing that with every animal you save and every day you talk about being vegan. So thank you so, so much. Uh, it's really, really powerful, Renee. All right, I think that uh, with time, we're going to now transition over to our next speaker. But Renee, thank you so, so much for being here, for your perspective. It's just been amazing. Uh, thank you for all you do. Everyone um, look up, if you don't know already, Rowdy Girl Sanctuary. Be sure to look into all that they're doing. They have so many amazing programs. And uh, we were just honored to have you, Renee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hope. Honored to be here. Great. All right. So we're going to transition now to our next speaker. And I'm going to uh, end this recording. Oops, hang on. Hang on, what have I done? Um, sorry, hang on a second. Not sure. How do I end the recording? Oh, here we go. Stop recording. Okay, here we go. <laughs>